Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about mental status examination in clinical psychiatry. I am Dr. Suresh Padadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, Head of Telemedicine Center, Head of Forensic Psychiatry Unit at Nimans, Bangalore. We are going to discuss about mental status examination. It is a part of complete detailed evaluation under clinical psychiatry. Let's understand what is mental status examination, how to do the examination, what is the duration for to do this examination. Mental status examination it is defined as a systematic and a structured approach of an or a series of assessments and observation carried out regarding the patient's appearance, behavior, activity, speech, thought, mood, perception and cognitive functions. So, it is a complete profiling of mental status examination. Mental status examination is not a standalone examination. It is a comprehensively a history taking, premorbid personality, family history, general physical examination and mental status examination. We should never take mental status examination independently. It has to be a complete comprehensive picture and mental status examination is a part of it. Never take this mental status examination alone. It should be part of a comprehensive assessment. How it is done? Before you start a mental status examination, you need to collect the information. It may be talking to the family members, talking to the patient's relatives, friends, older file, past history of treatment. Once you collected the, all the information, you may have to observe the patient. And next, you have to interview and also do certain cognitive tests. And also, this mental status examination is usually for two weeks to four weeks. That is usually, this mental status examination is examination covering over a period of one month. So that is what we call it as mental status examination duration. How often it is done? Invariably, the mental status examination can be done on inpatient or an outpatient and actually it is a clinical examination. To some extent, it is a semi-structured assessment. In inpatient, you can do two to three times per week. It is depending upon the patient's symptom severity and also how the symptoms are evolving. You may sometimes in forensic cases, you may have to do daily. If the patient is almost settling, you may do weekly ones. It is depending upon the clinical picture and also the need we have to titrate the assessment. On outpatient you can do during the follow-up. It may be once a month or else even if the patient is visiting two months once or a thrice a month once you can do the mental status examination. Please do remember before you do the mental status examination try to collect all information from the file from the family members, patient and relatives. And also, if the patient is admitted, never forget to talk to the nurses and other mental health professionals who are also seeing the patient because they are going to give a valid information about the patient's behavior and also his mood status. Who should do it? Invariably, it is done by a psychiatrist or else the resident doctor who is looking after the patient primary care doctors, psychologists, social worker and nurses are the people who are going to do a mental status examination. Let's understand what are the different components of mental status examination. First and the foremost, general appearance and behavior, psychomotor activity, speech. That is very essential here because the complete assessment of mental status examination is by speech, how he speaks, and how is his thought process? Thought, mood, perception and other phenomena. So this is the he seven different components of mental status examination. Let's take each one of them separately. Now we will move into the general appearance and behavior. In, generals, in general appearance and behavior, it starts before the patient comes into your interviewing room. You have to observe him. See the how patient comes to your room. Is there any abnormal behavior? How is he dressed? How is his hygiene? Whether he is coming voluntarily 
whether he requires some amount of coercion or else he has to be forcibly brought to your interviewing room. How is his facial expression? What is his body language? And of course, look at whether the personal hygiene is maintained well or not. And during the general appearance behavior, check whether the eye contact is made and maintained. And look for the cooperativeness, whether the patient is cooperative for the assessment or else whether he is uncooperative. Depending upon the cooperativeness, we have to switch the assessment. If it is uncooperativeness, we have to do Kirby's performa. I am doing an examination of uncooperative patient using Kirby's performa in an another video. Here we will consider that this patient is cooperative and we will continue with the examination. Rapport whether it is established or not, was it difficult to establish the rapport or whether it is easily established, that has to be commented. And also behavior during the complete interview has to be commented. And also is there any abnormal movement like stereotypes, mannerism, dyskinesia, whether he was able to sit comfortably in the chair, whether he was pacing up and down, all those issues has to be explained in general appearance and behavior. Now let's move to the next important point that is psychomotor activity. Psychomotor activity is basically an activity which is goal directed. Whether there was any goal directed activity has been increased or decreased. For example, goal directed activity is if the patient wants to take a book, whether he is going and every second or every minute he is doing a goal directed activity. They are called as increased goal directed activity which is commonly seen in mania. However, if there is a goal directed activity is very slow or retarded, we can say psychomotor retardation. In some times, the patient with schizophrenia will be restless. They will be moving up and down. They will be pacing up and down. They will be not be able to sit in one place, especially if they have side effects like akathisia. So in that situation, you may have to write restlessness was there or the patient was pacing up and down. This is about the psychomotor activity. Let's move on to the third important point, speech. How do we assess the speech? Because the whole assessment and access to the patient's mental faculty or else the functioning of the cognition is through speech. Before we assess the speech, please do take a speech sample by asking you open-ended questions. Invariably, a good psychiatric interview starts with the open-ended questions. At the end, it becomes closed-ended questions to know a specific points. For example, how do you ask about open-ended questions? It is basically, you can ask, tell me about your a festival like the Pauli, Christmas, Ramzan. Tell me about your place. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your agricultural field. What are you growing? Tell me about the current affairs, politics. Tell me about the game which you had played recently, the cricket. Tell me about the sports. Tell me about your favorite movie which you had seen. Explain about that. Tell me about the serial which you are seeing in the TV or the movie, market. Tell me something about your schooling, college. So if you are giving a open-ended question, the patient gets, a, gets an opportunity to speak widely about his about whatever it comes to his mind that means you are getting a full access to his thinking process so open ended questions are very essential for speech sample in the in this assessment avoid asking closed ended questions where the answer will be either yes or no so don't ask such questions ask for open ended questions that is very essential and to know the open-ended question, if you are able to know the hobbies and interests of the patient, then you can ask questions related to that. If a patient is very interested in football, you can ask him, tell me about the football. How does UK is playing about the football currently? So such questions will open him and he will give full information and you will be able to get a good speech sample. And when you get a good speech sample, please do record it verbatim. Many a time, if the patient is speaking very fast, you may not be able to uh, document. At that time, what you have to do is, if possible, if you have a mobile phone, take consent, record it, and then translate it or else put it down as a verbatim report. Once you get the speech sample, now you have to comment 
whether it was coherent. Coherent means the language or the speech language is logical, consistent and you are understanding and you are able to understand the word the patient spoke, whether it is relevant to the question you had asked. If you had asked for football, you were able to give, he was able to give a complete picture of the football which he was, you are able to understand and he was able to speak only about the football and what was the tone, whether it was loud, whether it was low and also tempo, whether it was fast or it is very slow. Reaction time, reaction time, whether he is answering very fast or he is responding very fast, that is commonly seen in mania, reaction time is decreased. Reaction time is increased, that's basically in depression, patient takes time to respond. After you ask a question, you will respond after 2 to 3 seconds or 4 seconds later. What is the volume? Whether he is speaking too much, <clears throat> you are finding it very difficult to stop him. He goes on speaking for nearly 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You have to interrupt him. Then you can say the volume is more. Invariably, it will be considered as pressure of speech if he has more than 150 words per, per minute then only it will be called as pressure of speech but however that is usually used in uh, research but in normal clinical practice if the interviewer finds it very difficult to interrupt the patient we usually call it as pressure of speech after the assessment of speech now we will move towards the thought basically in thought you have already got a good speech sample and now you will assess depending upon the speech sample what is the form, stream, possession and the content of the thought? Let's understand form. Form is nothing but organization and expression of thought. And in simple words, the way the Goldstein has spoken, he has said that it is the loss of abstraction which occurs in formal thought disorder. That is conceptualization or abstractability is considered as form. So, in formal thought disorder, it is the disorder of conceptualization or a loss of abstract thinking. So, that is called as formal thought disorder. In the formal thought disorder, it invariably has been classified as positive formal thought disorder and negative formal thought disorder. In negative formal thought disorder, there is poverty of speech and poverty of content of speech, which commonly seen in negative schizophrenia or negative symptoms in schizophrenia. In positive formal thought disorder, various people have classified like Cameroon, Bloiler, Goldstein and Snyder. Let's take some of the example. Cameroon has classified this formal thought disorder into ACE indices, metanorms and over-inclusion. Over ACE indices basically the connection between the two thoughts is completely lacking. Metonyms is basically misuse of symbols where the person is using the words wrongly. Over inclusion means there are two or more thoughts are interspersed so that the person's speech becomes very difficult to understand. Goldstein lost of abstract thinking and coming to the Snyder he has been he has given a complete picture of uh, various formal thought disorder like derailment, omission, substitution etc. So, if you are unable to understand a speech and you are unable to make any sense out of it, it will be considered as formal thought disorder. Formal thought disorder is very commonly seen in schizophrenia. However, you have to distinguish, distinguish between formal thought disorder and flight of ideas. Whereas flight of ideas, you will be able to understand, but the patient will be jumping from one topic to another topic and you will be able to trace back his thought process. That is called as flight of ideas. It will be lively embellishment in the flight of ideas. Coming to the stream. Stream is nothing but flow and continuity of thought process. The previous one was form. Now, how the thought process is running. So, with regard to disorders of stream, the disorders of tempo, disorders of continuity. With regard to tempo, how the thought is flowing, whether it is flowing very fast, Flight of ideas, slow, it is retardation of thinking or else there is a normal pro, normal pace but however the patient is talking very trivial things that is circumstantiality. So these are all disorders of tempo with regard to stream. 
coming to the disorders of continuity, where is perseveration and thought blocking. With regard to all these things, I'll be doing a separate video describing and giving explanation about each of the phenomena. Moving to the possession of thoughts. Who is the owner of this thought? That is the considered as possession. If the patient feels it is his own thoughts but he is unable to control them, they are all obsessions and he is unable to control his act but he knows it is under his will, under his control, that is compulsion. And the commonest phenomena we are going to express, express or explain under possession is impulses, obsession, compulsion, phobias and imageries. Suppose if the patient says the thoughts are uh, the thoughts which he is getting is not his own thoughts but somebody else. He attributes truths to external agency like thought elation phenomena, like thought withdrawal, thought insertion, thought broadcast. So those are the phenomena we are going to explain here, including made act, made effect. All those will be explained here under possession. Moving to the content. With regard to thought content, there are some of the very important uh, thought disorder phenomena has to be explained here. With regard to content, one is delusions, overvalid ideas, depressive cognitions, preoccupations, suicidal ideas and death wishes. Let's discuss individual one. Coming to delusions. Delusions are nothing but false fixed belief which is beyond the patient's social cultural background and which has morbid origin. That means in spite of giving a contrary evidence, the patient continues to believe that he has that belief is true. For example, the patient believes people are trying to harm him trying to kill him. That is called as delusion of persecution. None of his family members, relatives, friend believe in that. But the patient believes and it is false and it is fixed beyond the patient's social cultural background and it is morbid in origin. When you give, explain, you have to give a detailed description of the phenomena. You have to take a complete speech sample about the process. Tell whether the patient has single delusion or multiple delusion. For example, you may have delusion of persecution, delusion of reference, delusion of nihilism. If he has, then you will be mentioning his multiple delusion. Whether these delusions are bizarre or non-bizarre. Bizarre is basically beyond the socio-cultural background. Along with that, it is against the nature. And the family members and relatives and the society members do not accept which is possible, which is completely implausible then only it will be called as bizarre. And bizarreness is an example for schizophrenia. Whether these delusions are fixed, continuously present or else it is fleeting in nature. In a 24 hours, he may get this delusion for a period of half an hour, one hour. So fleeting or else continuously present. Whether they are systematized or poorly systematized. Systematized is basically about the logical way of explaining the delusion. If you are able to give one delusion and you say yes it is possible, the rest of the story he is able to give a logical explanation that is called as systematization. Whether these delusions are mood congruent or incongruent. If imagine if a person has mania who is very happy but he at the same time he also has delusion of nihilism then we call it as we call it as a mood incongruent delusion. Whether there is an acting out. Imagine if a person has delusion of persecution and he goes on beating the public and also the neighbors who were passes in front of the house. And also finally you have to tell the type of delusion. It is a grandiose delusion, referential delusion. Those are the naming you have to do. That is the whole explanation you have to give with regard to delusion. Coming to the overvalued idea. Overvalued, overvalued idea and delusion, they are almost similar but the delusion, the fixity and beyond the social cultural ground will be very high. Whereas in overvalued idea, there will be some amount of fleeting. But however, one idea gets precedence over other ideas because of associated feeling of tone. Because of that, one idea may be becoming predominant. For example, a person may say, the Bangalore is the best city in the world. In spite of many people are able to give a contrary evidence, 
but however that associated feeling of tone that bangalore is my mother place or my birthplace and i don't want to let go at any cost and then he continues to hold that then it becomes a more valid idea coming to the depressive cognitions basically if the patient gives a idea of hopelessness worthlessness and helplessness basically he says there is no hope for me in future and i am completely worthless i have become dependent on my family members and nobody can help me so if he is able to give these we will call it as depressive cognition whether the patient has suicidal ideas that wishes please talk about how much intensity how frequently he gets these ideas whether he has planned to attempt suicide how is he planning to do it whether he is wants help or not so those all information has to be captured under thought and finally you have to talk about preoccupation preoccupation about the somatization like somatic symptoms he gives a like multiple somatic somatic aches and pains that has to be captured here hypochondriacal delusions or hypochondriasis like telling that a fear of having an illness if it is there that has to be explained here and also with regard to body image disturbance also has to be explained under thought content moving to the the important part is the mood that is the fifth uh, component in the mood you have to assess two important things mood means a emotional state which is a longitudinal phenomena whereas affect is a cross sectional in the assessment of mood we are going to do both when you are asking for a subjective report you ask him tell me how is your mood since past one week then it will become a subjective report objective report what you observe what is is uh, the emotional state which is depicted that will be a affect state it is a cross sectional assessment so subjective report and objective report whether his mood state is congruent through to his thought process if he is speaking about good things about life that he has achieved lot of thing and then he is crying then it becomes incongruent whether he is also showing a facial expression about being happy and he is talking about the achievements then it is the mood is congruent to his thought process appropriate to the situation the way he is responding to your question and how is his mood response that becomes appropriate to the situation or not if the patient is continuously laughing inappropriately then you are going to make it as inappropriate laughter whether his the mood is has a range whether it is restricted or else he is able to uh, whether the range is completely intact he is able to feel the happiness at the sadness whenever the uh, when we is talking about the sad information reactivity is present or absent and liability liability is the rapid extreme change of emotion for a second he is happy within another second he becomes completely sad so the happiness and sadness shifts very fast and it's very difficult to pinpoint what what emotion he is experiencing that will becomes liability moving to the important part is perception perception is nothing but the uh, what we perceive from the various five senses the basically we are going to describe about hallucination pseudo hallucination and illusions hallucinations is nothing but perception without stimuli whereas pseudo hallucinations they are not hallucination but they are false hallucination or we can call it as they are an hallucination within the subjective space subjective like auditory imageries visual imageries so they are not vivid they are not very clear they are not so uh, fresh as like hallucination so pseudo hallucinations are to some extent able to controlled by the patient illusions basically misinterpretation interpretation of the stimuli we call it as illusion coming to the hallucination there are various different types of hallucination the very commonly seen in psychiatry is auditory hallucination hearing of voices visual hallucination tactile hallucination gustatory hallucination olfactory hallucination and also when you are going to talk about this you will describe the experience of the patient what the patient is undergoing how many voices here he is hearing and also when he hears these voices or he sees people you have to ask whether it is in a clear consciousness awake or not so that is very essential if he is going to get this hallucination when he is going to sleep 
then it becomes hypnagogic hallucination. When he is coming out of sleep, it becomes hypnopompic hallucination. So, the presence of hallucination in a clear consciousness is very essential to say this is a morbid psychopathology. How the patient experiences? First and the foremost, you have to give a verbatim report of the auditory hallucination. And then you have to tell whether the patient has single or multiple hallucinations, whether, they, whether he is able to control them, unable to control them, whether they are in verbal hallucination, non-verbal hallucination, maybe music, maybe hearing of bell, or whether a vehicle moving around, and also whether they are familiar, unfamiliar voices, familiar hallucination, unfamiliar hallucination, pleasant, whether he likes them, whether he doesn't like them, whether they are continuous in nature or intermittent in nature. And also you have to classify whether they are first degree, first person auditory hallucination, second person and third person. First person is basically the patient is hearing his own voices. Basically whenever he thinks something, those thoughts are repeated in his own voice. They are all first person auditory hallucination. They are basically thought echo. Second person auditory hallucination is the hallucinations are directly talking to the patient. It may be commenting, it may be commanding him to do certain things. They are all second person auditory hallucination. Third person is the voices or the hallucinations are discussing among themselves about the patient. The patient is a third party here. The voices are discussing about him. Then it becomes a third person auditory hallucination. And what is the response of the patient towards the hallucination? And also, finally, you have to interpret telling that the patient has multiple auditory hallucination which are present in clear consciousness and they are second degree, second person auditory hallucination. Moving to the last part, other phenomena. Other phenomena are such as somatic passivity, passivity where the patient says that he is receiving certain somatic experiences which is done by an external agency. For example, the patient may see say that he is getting electrical shock-like stimulation over his body because somebody else is using the satellite. Through the satellite, they are passing these uh, electrical impulses on his body. Such a kind of somatic passive, passivity experience has to be explained here. Depersonalization and derealization phenomena has to be explained here. Depersonalization is nothing but as if feeling of his or her and he feels that his feelings are detached completely and he is distant and they are recurrent and persistent. This depersonalization phenomena is very commonly seen in extremely anxious or extremely depressed patient. And this is as if feeling that his feelings are completely detached. He is watching those feelings and he is absorbing them and he is unable to feel that. For example, one of the patients said that he saw his daddy's dead body but he is unable to feel that he is feeling sad and he felt that he is absorbing the feelings but he is unable to feel it completely. That depersonalization phenomena is that classical example. Derealization phenomena is as if the whole world is unreal, the people are unreal, the surrounding is like a drama, artificial and he feels it is distant and lifeless. So that derealization phenomena is also extremely frightening to certain patients. So those phenomena has to be explained here. My dear friends, so we have discussed about various aspects of the cognitive functions will be taken in the next video. But however, in the mental status examination, general appearance and behavior, psychomotor activity, speech, thought, mood, perception and other phenomena have been discussed in this video. To know about the cognitive function, please do watch another video which will be released shortly. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time. And if you like this video, please do subscribe to our channel. Stay safe.